Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second session. Uh, Ma'am, can you please switch on your video? Yes. So we have with us for the session, Dr. Shruti Dara Sharma, Assistant Professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Prior joining IIT Jodhpur, she served at NIT Delhi as an assistant professor for a bargaining office. She completed her PhD in 2017 from IIT Guwahati and Aristotle University in Greece, Thessaloniki, Greece, and thereafter remained postdoctorate fellow in Kunsan National University of South Korea. She won the prestigious Erasmus Mundus Fellowship from European Commission during her PhD <laughs> and represented India in Japan through Genesis 2.0 program. She was also awarded the gold medal for securing the first position in mechanical engineering due her, during her BTEC from Tejpur University. Her research interest lies in intersection of mechanical engineering, material science, and nanotechnology. Her works in the field of thin films, nanocomposite materials, and sensors have been published in reputed peer reviewed journals, including ASME Journal of Engineering Materials and Technology, Journal of Cleaner Production Energies, etc., and international conferences in the country and ab abroad. She has guided two undergraduate and three postgraduate students till now. Besides academics, she is an excellent performer of music. She is in a national level tabla player, graded artist of All India Radio, and a state level player of Tikwando. Welcome, ma'am. So we have a multi faceted personality with us, young, dynamic. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Welcome to the session on behalf of. Uh, MLR Institute of Technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Nice one. So, uh, yeah, you can stop the share and. Uh, um, I'll share my screen. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you, Sweta, for uh, this uh, quick and a nice introduction. And uh, uh, before beginning, I'd like to thank the MLR Institute of Technology for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this FTP and uh, share my research ideas and research uh, uh, projects and thoughts with uh, all of you present here. Although uh, my research is, uh, of course, it includes nanocomposites, like already Shweta has mentioned, but it is not directly associated to aerospace industry. But today I'd like to keep my talk in this domain only. But otherwise, my research also encompasses the medical field, for example, uh, nanocomposites and such materials in medical imaging techniques and uh, drug delivery and all those kind of things. But uh, I'll not go there because our topic uh, for this FDP is uh, recent developments uh, of nanocomposites in the aerospace. So I'd like to keep that. My uh, topic of presentation for today is laminated nanocomposite uh, based thin film sensors for transient measurements, which are basically used in uh, tra highly transient environments. For example, the re-entry vehicles or very high speed um, jet planes or fighters or military aircrafts or something like that, or maybe uh, some other uh, updated version of aircrafts called, which are known as morphing aircrafts or spa inflated spacecrafts, which are used maybe not in India, but abroad for uh, monitoring and for surveillance purposes. So I'll, I'll, I'll start my presentation. And meanwhile, uh, right now I'm working in IIT Jodhpur and me and my group, we are setting up our laboratory. So we have a, a nice small group and I have my collaborators all over US and the UK. So by the end of this presentation, if there is anyone who is interested to work in these kind of fields, you can definitely reach out to me anytime using my email. 
ID this one. So my, my presentation will basically start from the, in the, the reverse order. First, we will discuss about transient measurements. Then we will move on to thin film sensors. Then we'll move on to nanocomposite based thin film sensors and finally to laminated nanocomposites. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll also tell you what kind of research domain you can pick up so that you can start working on this very interesting thing, which is, um, I find is very interesting, not only because this is my area of specialization, but also because of the new and the novelties that this field has, because it's a multidisciplinary, it lies in the intersection of mechanical, electrical, materials and nanotech. So let's start. The outline is something like this. Like I mentioned, I'll first start with transient measurements, then we'll move to thin film sensors. We'll elaborate on their structure and uh, related uh, analytical modeling that is important, that is required for designing thin film sensors. Then I'll move uh, in, towards the details of their fabrication and their uh, calibration part. And the calibration, in fact, will be in two parts, static and dynamic. And then finally, maybe I'll also uh, touch up on the, their applications. Then we'll move to nanomaterials, where we will talk about why nanomaterials are so important, what gives them their unusual properties. And in order to, in order to check their characteristics or in order to know them, because they are not visible to the naked eye, we have to, we must do characterization. So maybe I'll touch upon uh, just one or two characterization technique. Then we'll talk about their synthesis and especially we'll talk about CNTs because my research uh, till now has involved a lot of CNT. And then we'll talk about how CNT based sensors have been used uh, in different kind of uh, sensing. Uh, devices and uh, finally nanocomposite based sensors where I'll talk about temperature measurement first and then in secondly I'll talk about strain or pressure measurement and finally we'll talk about polymer nanocomposites and why they are so important in the aerospace industry. Uh, so <clears throat> let's talk about transient measurements. So transient means, as the name suggests, it is something which is rapidly varying with time. So for example, let's suppose you have a weighing machine and you are standing on, on top of it. You want to measure your weight. Suppose you weigh 60 kilo. The, the needle of the machine will not directly come to 60 kg. Maybe it will overshoot up to 61, come back down to 59, and then oscillate for some time before reaching the steady state final value, which is 60. So, that portion of the, the behavior of the needle just before reaching the steady state value can be called as transient because your even though your input is same, you are standing on that on that uh, weighing machine. Your output is constantly varying with time. So transient means we always uh, and basically when we talk about system, we always focus on their output, not uh, not majorly on the input. So if the output is constantly varying with time, then such kind of environments are, or situations are called as transient measurements. And these transient measurements right now we are talking about is in terms of milli or microseconds. So they are varying so fast. Uh, and those in, in, in order to capture those variations, we will need sensors which are, which, which are apt enough to capture such uh, drastic variations within such short amount of time. So for example, if you talk about a re-entry vehicle or a spacecraft, uh, which is uh, which is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. It has a thermal protection system which saves the astronauts inside from getting uh, burned into uh, uh, ashes. So such kind of vehicles, when they are re-entering, tremendous amount of heat is generated. And if the body of your uh, vehicle is not sufficiently uh, thermally insulated, then it can collapse. What happened to the Apollo, uh, Kalpana Chawla, everyone knows about that. So in such kind of measurement, what happens, you will see that the temperature variation happens within fraction of seconds, within milli or microseconds. And it can even vary within degrees, like two, three degrees within one, one second or something. So in order to find out sensors which are such, uh, which have uh, such low response times, it's very difficult. So when we talk about such kind of transient measurements, we have different types of uh, measuring devices or uh, or sensors, we can say, for example, we have thermocouple, we have liquid crystal thermography, 
where the, where the color of the crystal changes when the environment temperature changes. Then we have infrared thermography and a series of others like calorimeters and all. But when we have to select uh, one specific sensor for such uh, uh, an environment, we majorly decide on three things. The first is the temperature range. If the temperature range should be big enough so that you don't need more than one or, for example, if you're using a thermocouple, you must be knowing that thermocouple has specific temperature range. So if you want to measure a very wide range of temperatures, then you might need different types of thermocouples, J, K, T, and then, it, then the complexity of the system also increases. So we need something which can, which can measure the wide variation of uh, uh, temperature. So wide range is one uh, important thing. Then the second, like I have been mentioning, is response time because we are talking about transient environment. And thirdly, the most important is sensitivity. So if your sensor is not sensitive enough, then it will not give you the output even if there is a change in the input. Let's say, for example, if you're using a thermocouple, which is only sensitive to a change of one degree, then you won't be able to measure anything uh, below that. For example, if the temperature variation is happening in 0.5 degrees, your thermocouple won't be showing you any output. So considering all these things, we see that thin film sensors are, or thin film gauges are very, very apt and potential in this field because they consist of thin film. First of all, they are kind of RTDs, resistance temperature detectors. So they're very easy to read. Secondly, they, are, they consist of a very, very thin film. So the thermal conductivity of the film and, uh, and the electrical conductivity of the film is also very high. So immediately when you apply some amount of heat on the film, it immediately goes uh, beyond it. So it's like instantaneous measurement, which is why uh, it, it, it allows instantaneous measurement. And thirdly, compared to sensitivity, thin film sensors are almost 10 times more sensitive than the thermocouples. So keeping all this in view, we started our studies in thin film sensors. So basically the structure is something like this. This is a very crude uh, form of a thin film sensor. As you can see, you have a very uh, thin film of uh, silver or any conducting metallic film for that matter, which is topped on a uh, insulator. So this film will be of the order of microns. You can, technically it should be below 50 microns, but because this was the first time that it was fabricated and it was a very crude method that we handled, uh, it is known as hand painting method, where we simply uh, take a brush and we just paint the film on top of the insulator. So the thickness was well within 50 to 100 micrometer. Still then, uh, it's not the thickness of the film that is more important here. It is the ratio of the thickness of the film to the thickness of the substrate, which is much more important. I'll come back to that, why that is important. But yeah, let's see how thin film works. So now this is your thin uh, silver film, which is on the substrate. This substrate can be anything like glass, pyrex, uh, maker, or any kind of ceramic. And this film can be anything which is highly conductive in nature. Typically and traditionally, uh, platinum, gold, silver, this kind of metals has been used. But of course, they are costly. And then there are other problems I'll, I'll talk in a bit. So what happens is when we top this film and then you have to, you have to extend that film uh, like literally uh, on, the, on the sides, horizontally on the sides of the ceramic. This extension is just to allow you to uh, fix the conducting wires or the lead wires so that you can take a measurement. Now what happens when you apply heat on the top this application of heat will change the resistance of the film. And that change in resistance will be visible to the user in terms of voltage output. So basically by, uh, uh, by noting down what kind of voltage uh, change is happening, you can actually figure out what kind of uh, heat input is being given to the uh, sensor. And because this sensor immediately responds, it has a response time of, allow of around milliseconds. So that means it allows us for transient heat measurement also. However, in order to uh, use it for transient measurements, we have to follow certain rule. Come back to that rule in a bit. Now this film, when if you look at it under a surface profiler, you see that it is not at all uniform. This uh, red areas here shows the highly uh, thick portion 
of the film, while this white dots uh, means there is no film material present. So why, when you do uh, apply, uh, when you adopt such a uh, crude method of uh, fabrication like hand painting, then this kind of problem eventually obviously occurs. It would not matter if you are, if, uh, it depends on the application, what kind of precise uh, measurement if you want. But if you wanna go for a very, very precise measurement, uh, and uh, for example, if you want to read heat fluxes, which are very, very low, maybe like one watt per meter squared or something, then you would need a very, very uniform film. And in order to get that uniform fill, film, you will have to then uh, uh, adopt uh, more sophisticated techniques uh, like thermal uh, evaporation technique or physical vapor deposition or maybe even chemical vapor deposition. Anyway, so once the, this uh, sensor is made, then you simply wrap it up with Teflon so that uh, these, these connections are secure and they do not come off. And then now this uh, gauge is so crude, uh, so robust and so like rough and tough, you can even use it in very harsh environment, for example, in shock tunnels or like similar, maybe even in aircrafts. We, we actually tested them in shock tubes in the shock, uh, yeah, in the shock tubes in the of the department, and then uh, yeah. But commercially, if you go and buy thin films, it, it will always come in a, in a pack and uh, something like this. So you cannot see the actual film that is being uh, uh, which is inside this uh, sensor. But uh, what people do is instead of generally applying only one film like this, they would uh, they would make a serpentine kind of uh, structure so that you get. Uh, higher initial resistance. So higher initial resistance means your higher uh, initial voltage will be high. And if you have higher initial voltage, then that reduces the use of an amplifier uh, while you use it in practical purpose. Now, <clears throat> after that, I said like, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to use this uh, thin film sensors as heat flux gauges, that means you can figure out the heat flux which is falling on top of the on top of the sensor just by looking at its temperature profile. So something like this: if this is your sensor and uh, you are applying constant heat flux on the surface, then just by measuring now its uh, temperature profile with respect uh, to time, so temperature versus time history, if you know, you can recalculate back. Uh, the heat flux which is being subjected here. But in order to do that, we have to follow one some, some rule, I, I said. So what is that rule? That rule is your thin film sensor must follow this semi-infinite uh, uh, body. So semi, what is a semi-infinite body? It is actually an idealized body, which says that it has only one single plane surface for example here, and the rest of the surface extends to infinity. When, it, when we say extends to infinity, practically it's not possible, you know, but what we mean is that if you are applying heat or if you're doing something in this phase, then the rest other three phases are totally uninterrupted or uninfluenced by it. So if that is possible, then what happens in, in this, if this is semi-infinite solid, uh, then the, the, the diffusion of heat can be uh, mathematically formulated through only transient one-dimensional uh, heat conduction. So otherwise we should have taken uh, 2D, heat 2D unsteady heat conduction equation. I mean, our governing equation, if you're trying to do some kind of simulation, but if you assume it to be a semi-infinite body, uh, it, our life becomes much more easier because then we just have to solve the 1D conduction. And then sim uh, employing this 1D heat conduction, you can, we can simply, figure out the heat flux from the temperature profile. So now what we do first, we study something known as the thermal penetration depth. It says that the distance the heat will diffuse through the substrate during the experimental runtime. So let's suppose you are applying 10 kilowatt per meter square uh, heat flux here, and then you measure for one second or maybe 0.5 uh, seconds. You want to see until how much uh, this heat is diffusing into the substrate. This film, I said this film is very, very thin. So we uh, make an assumption here that the moment you apply heat on the top part of the film, it immediately reaches the bottom part. So that's considered as instantaneous. But after that, the, the, this, this penetration into the substrate is um, 
transient and that can be done using this simulation. So we did a small simulation. We gave all these boundary conditions and then we figured out that um, we did it for different time scales. So one millisecond, 10 millisecond, 100 and 1000. And we studied that how much it is penetrating. So we saw that even for one, uh, one second, 1000 millisecond means even for one second, the penetration depth is like 50.4, which is good enough. And then if your thermal penetration depth lies anywhere below 50%, then you are good to go. So now if you, if you wanna, why am I talking this? Why am I telling you about this is, uh, because I said initially that this is, it's not the, it's not only the thickness of the film that is important. It is the ratio of the thickness of the film to the thickness of the substrate. So now if you do this, and then if you reduce the dimensions proportionately, if you reduce the film into a nanometer thickness, then you can also reduce the substrate body to micrometer thickness or maybe millimeter thickness accordingly. So that's how we have a chance here to, to transfer this whole idea into the nano regime and then figure out uh, how to use uh, nano composites in case of this uh, in case of this metallic film. And why nanocomposites, that also I'll tell you. Now, anyway, so we did this uh, in this uh, uh, through ANSYS and we used this 2D heat conduction equation in order to just figure out the thermal penetration depth. But while figuring out the heat flux, we will use only 1D. So then we did, this in, did the same thing in, in 3D as well. So when we did it in 3D, it came out something like that. So our results were verified both in 2D and 3D. And we knew that, okay, now at least for one second time scale, we can do our experiments without any uh, inaccuracy in the result. So if our, what I mean is, if our experiments are happening within this one second limit, then we have uh, the full authority to convert this temperature profile into heat flux or vice versa. So this is what we plotted and we checked. Again, this, it's the same thing, it's just uh, plotted inside in a, in a different manner. And we, we checked that this, this is where the thermal penetration is happening and uh, with respect to the different uh, time, uh, experimental runtime. And then when we checked that the it, it is, this is happening only at the vicinity of the film and uh, the rest of the substrate is like almost unaffected. So our semi-infinite theory is valid. So after we validate, this is just a zoomed version of this part. So after we validated our results, what we did is, now we'll have to talk about the modeling part. I said, once it becomes a semi-infinite solid, our life becomes easier because now we can assume one day heat conduction. So we assume one day heat conduction and then we employ the initial and boundary conditions. So this is this is uh, this is uh, already well known. This had been used by various people and various researchers throughout. So there is nothing new about this. This is just required. It's a purely mathematical analytical uh, uh, technique which is employed in order to calculate the surface uh, heat flux from a temperature profile. And uh, <clears throat> so we em em employ inverse uh, 1D equation and Laplace uh, equation. So finally, we get an integral, which is known as a Duhamel's integral. And as you can see, it relates the heat flux, surface heat flux to the surface temperature history. So if we know the surface temperature history, then we can figure out the heat flux. So, and then figuring out the heat flux, how we do is, let's suppose if this is, you know, let's suppose this is the temperature profile. This is the temperature profile, which is recorded by the thin film sensor. It will not record temperature, actually it will record voltage. So you will see voltage and then you have to convert it into temperature. When you do that, this temperature curve, now you will try to fit it with a polynomial equation, polynomial or any kind of equation. Once you fit it with a polynomial equation, then you have two techniques. One is called least square, the other one is cubic spline. This is just a curve fitting technique, nothing uh, big. It just looks like uh, very messy because uh, the mathematical equation is clumsy, but otherwise this is just a curve fitting technique. Once we know the curve, uh, once we have fitted our curve we, using this uh, polynomial equation. So this is the temperature profile and we have used a polynomial equation of i-th order, uh, sorry, m-th order in order, to, in order to fit this. So we have now fit this with a polynomial equation. And after that we use, this least square and the cubic spline method 
in order to recalculate back the heat flux. So it, it goes like this, that we, we know what amount of uh, heat flux we are employing, we are subjecting the thin film sensor to. Then we obtain a temperature history like this. Then we fit a curve, and then we use these equations to figure out that heat flux which we are employing. This is just to uh, just kind of a cross checking that we are doing. When we do that, we, it is it is evident that this uh, least square, the least square it, it, it uh, underestimates the actual value, and also it is kind of wavy in nature. So absolutely, we assume this cubic spline method, and then whenever we have to figure out the heat flux from the temperature history, we simply employ this cubic spline method. It's much more smoother and much more accurate compared to the least pair method. So I'll come back to it where we are employing that technique. But before that, let's talk about the fabrication. So like I mentioned, the first and very crude way of manufacturing a, a thin film sensor is by simply hand painting. You take your substrate, you take your conducting paste, any kind of highly conducting material, and then you take a painting brush, you put it on the uh, insulating substrate and then you draw the lead wires, do the connection and uh, bake it at a desired temperature in an oven and you get your thin film sensor. But if you do that, like I mentioned here, if you do that, then the film is non-uniform. And if the film is non-uniform, then we'll have problems while capturing this temperature profile. And if we have a problem in capturing this temperature profile, we will not be able to accurately measure the heat flux, which is why we adopted other sophisticated technique, which is known as the thermal evaporation technique. Here, what you do, this is, uh, the, this is the inside of this thermal, th thermal evaporation uh, technique that we used. You have the substrate. So you, uh, you fix the substrate upside down here and then for upside down as in, so if you want this part, this size of the part of the substrate to be coated with the uh, film, then you, you know, put it like this so that, and you put your uh, metal or uh, metallic powder of whatever, gold or platinum or silver, you put here in, in, a, in a boat, and then you pass high voltage. So that high voltage will impart heat into that uh, uh, into those particles into those metallic particles or maybe the solid metal then it will sublime it will evaporate and then it will look for places to get condensed so your substrates are substrates are already sitting here upside down so all of this sublimated particles will go and then they will form a nice uniform thin film over the substrate so if you employ that method you can actually control the thickness of the film and you can also uh, control uh, uniform uniformity of the film. So if we do that, then our measurements become much more accurate. So the fabrication techniques go something like this. First of all, of course, you will sub uh, select a substrate, which is an insulator. Then you are going to polish it with uh, sandpapers. So you will keep on varying the uh, grain size of the, the sandpaper until a visible smooth surface is achieved. Then we wash it and then you simply heat it in a, like 50, 60 degrees just to uh, get rid of the uh, excess moisture. After that, we uh, put it inside this uh, vacuum chamber. We create high vacuum so that there are no impurities left. And then we allow this uh, metals to sublime. Once the metals sublime, the vapor will go up and then they will condense on the surface of the substrate, leaving a very thin uniform layer of the conducting film. Once the film is formed, we take them out and then we apply this uh, horizontal silver strips on both the sides so that we can secure the uh, lead wires. Once the lead wires are secured, we'll measure it using a multimeter. If we have the desired initial resistance, then it is well and good. If we do not get the desired initial resistance, that means that film thickness is very, very low. So then we will put it inside again, and then we will try to uh, put another layer. So from here it, the, comes the idea of laminated. Laminated means you hit something to, to laminate. So it is practically like laminating our certificates just like we apply heat and then we put a thin plastic layer. Uh, so this is where it started. And if you can employ different materials uh, and 
try, can create layers actually, then that is known as a laminated uh, layer by layer lamination. So this, uh, you, you will see it will come up in, uh, in some time, but this is just the beginning. So after that, uh, once the lead wire connections are made, we measure the output uh, resistance. So if the resistance is like uh, anything below 50 to 100 ohm, then it is very, uh, very good. And if not, then we will uh, put another film until that desired resistance is uh, achieved. After that <clears throat> comes the calibration part. Now, just fabrication of the sensor is not sufficient. We need to calibrate it. Calibrate means we have to, we have to find out the curve which will tell us how the volt output will vary with input. So uh, doing this calibration, again, there are two parts. One is the static calibration where the input will remain same, will not vary with time. And the second one is dynamic calibration. In static calibration, we have a system something like this, where we have a heater and we have an oil. Inside this oil, this, this oil is very viscous, so that when you start heating, that you can assume that it is uniformly heated. So the, there will be uh, no abrupt thermal gradient present inside the oil. So when it, when it starts heating uniformly, then we place a beaker and inside that beaker is empty. And inside that beaker, we will keep our uh, sensor and we will at the same time, we'll also keep a thermometer. We'll keep them both very close so that there is no thermal gradient again between the two sensors. And then we will start measuring the temperature of the air using the thermometer. And at the same time, we will start measuring the voltage, which is shown by the sensor. When we do that, we get a curve something like this. If we get this, now I already mentioned that thin film sensors are like RTDs. And RTDs means uh, we need, it, it varies linearly with time. Uh, sorry, with, linearly with input. So you, you remember we, in RTDs, the resistance is like R is R naught one plus alpha delta T. So with respect to the variation is in temperature, your R is going to change. So this gives us a curve, something like this, and it, which is linear. So linearity gives us another important um, thing. Now you can easily extrapolate or interpolate uh, any figure within this curve. Once you have this curve, because this is linear, you know there is a certain slope of this curve. So once you know the slope, even if you do not carry out your calibration beyond 80 degrees, if I ask you to find out what is what will be the output voltage uh, at 120 degree, you can simply extrapolate it. And similarly for any numbers in between. So that's why uh, thin film sensors are very, very uh, common as well, I, I mean, People are doing research in it because they are not only use, easy to read, but they also give us a linear input output variation. Now, having said that, this is known as static calibration, where we change the uh, air temperature, but we wait for sufficient amount of time. And then your therm the thermometer, when it uh, shows, let's say 30 degree or 40 degree or 50 degree, we note down the temperature. So this is more or less a static calibration. In dynamic calibration, what happens is we do the same thing, but this time, instead of slowly changing the environment temperature, we abruptly change it. So we apply inputs in of different types, uh, maybe step or ramp or impulse. In our cases, we did step and impulse. So impulse can be applied using, let's say a laser power. So if you immediately give an input using a laser, that could be an impulse input. And then you figure out what is the output uh, of, your, of your sensor. Now, in this case, we used a hot air gun. So we know what amount of heat flux we are, the, this surface is facing. And then we note down what is the voltage variation with respect to time. So from this voltage variation, we figure out what is the temperature versus time. So essentially we get, uh, essentially we get this kind of curve. Once we get this kind of curve, then we do the curve fitting technique. And when, when we do the curve fitting technique, then we employ this cubic spline method in order to calculate the heat flux. So when we employ this cubic spline method, this is how the heat flux look like. So it is a more or less uh, kind of a step, uh, step curve. So this is the response of the sensor. And then we try to figure out uh, whether it is matching with the input heat flux or not. Similarly, we, we do uh, impulse uh, 
uh, testing using laser. So we know what amount of laser power we are, um, we are giving in onto that uh, sensor surface. Uh, of course, we apply very, very low laser power and because the film otherwise will, will get burned. So there is, a, there is a limit to what amount of laser power you can apply and for how long. So after that, uh, again, we, we figure out what is the voltage versus time or temperature versus time. And from that, we employ this uh, fitting technique and then we employ the cubic spline to, figure, uh, to find out the uh, heat flux. So it's basically a cross-checking kind of thing. Once you get the heat flux curve, you then figure out whether it is an impulse or not. I have not included the figure here, but it comes out to be an uh, impulse curve like this. So now next thing is, now we have done this study for thin film sensors. Of course, okay, this can be used in um, highly transient environments from gas turbines to IC engines to aerospace industry. But then there are limitations, of course, because every sensor has its limitation. And this sensor has the limitation when it comes for detection of very, very low heat fluxes. So when we have to detect very, very low heat fluxes, um, let's say one watt per meter square, uh, or maybe even below that, then what happens, we need a film which is uh, very, very highly conducting, uh, which is having very, very high thermal and electrical conductivity. And then at the same time, we cannot even go for uh, very high costly sensors because if it is not cost effective, then it has no chance of getting commercialized, which is when nano composites came into picture. So we tried replacing this uh, film with nano composites. And before going to nanocomposites, let's uh, start with the nanomaterials. So nanomaterials, as you uh, must be aware of, uh, are materials which are of the size uh, nanometers. A nanometer is 10 to the power 9, which comes somewhere between the micron and the atomic size. So if we have to draw a comparison uh, with, uh, of nanomaterials with respect to the visible objects, we can do a comparison something like this. This is the size of the earth. And if you imagine a football, it is 10, time, 10 million times smaller than the earth. Then if you talk about the C60 molecule, which is a nano uh, material, it is actually a billion times smaller than the football itself. And maybe if you compare it with the human hair, it is a million times smaller. So now you can imagine at what dimension we are talking. So when you, when you go down to such a low uh, uh, dimension and you go down to nano region, then many of the things changes abruptly. Your properties of the material will not be any more equal to the properties of the uh, bulk properties of the material. Your thermal conductivity, your strength, and everything will change. Why that happened? There is a there's a very uh, interesting phenomena. Uh, let's suppose uh, we talk first about one unusual property, like the change of the color. So this happens due to quantum confinement. And quantum confinement uh, is uh, something like, it's basically confining the electron movement to uh, in a particular direction. So if you are confining it in one dimension, it is called 1D confinement. If you're able to confine the electron movement in two dimension, it is called 2D confinement. And if you can do that in 3D, it's a 3D confinement. And what does confinement means is that, now let's suppose take the example of a semiconductor. So if you have a normal semiconductor, this is, uh, this is very basic semiconductor theory. We have this valence band and conduction band. And if you excite an electron, that electron will move on to the conduction band. And after some time it will, uh, and once it moves to the conduction band, we have a created a electron and hole pair. So the electron will remain here and the hole will be created here. After some time, the electron will come back to occupy the hole that was created. And in the process, it will emit some light. Now, what happens if you keep on reducing the dimension of your of the of the object of the of the particle? Then what you will see, you will notice that this conduction and valence band, the, the difference between these two keeps on increasing. So what that means is it creates more energy. It takes more amount of energy to create an electron hole pair. Or in other words, the band gap increases. Or you can say that when the electron will fall back into the hole, it is going to emit a different amount of energy. So that energy can be is visible to us uh, in the form of light. And uh, as the frequency changes, as the energy changes, the, the wavelength of the light will also change. So doing this, you can actually uh, make gold particles which does not look uh, gold color anymore. Maybe you, it will look green, maybe it will look blue, it will be, maybe it will look red, 
depending on what size you are creating. And because of this uh, kind of unusual properties, this uh, we have entire uh, we have an entire field of uh, quantum dots, which are very very important in uh, sensing mechanism. When we when we talk about temperature sensing, like I I said. So this, this quantum dots, they emit different kinds of lights. So it, they are also sensitive to temperature. So by just by looking at the color, you can actually figure out what is the temperature of the environment and that can be used as a, is, as a sensing mechanism. But those kinds of sensing mechanisms are mostly done in biology, in biomedical devices and all. And uh, we uh, not, um, not much in your aerospace. So I, I was talking about quantum confinement. So if you confine in all three dimension, then they are known as quantum dots. That means the electron is not able to move in any of the three dimension. If you can confine in two dimension, that means the electron is still able to move in one, 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 one of the dimension. They are called nanotubes. And if you can confine only in one dimension, that means the electron is, is still free to move in X and Y, it cannot move only in Z. So those kind of uh, uh, dimension are known as nano layers. So nano layers are what we will be uh, creating uh, in our nano composite thin films because we want to have unusual properties like extremely high thermal conductivity or electrical conductivity like that. And uh, other than this uh, change of color, there are other uh, unusual properties also because now the surface to volume ratio has increased a lot. So you will see uh, that the sensitivity of the surface has increased. So this sensitivity is of course, again, it is related to this uh, biology more or less that uh, if you are trying to create a sensor which is trying to sense a target molecule, then if you use this kind of nanomaterials, you will see that you will have uh, a better sensitivity because it has now the surface to volume ratio has increased and the surface has become much more sensitive. But we can also em employ these uh, nanomaterials to, to, uh, to, build, uh, to build materials which are lighter but are tougher. So we can use them as uh, coatings in order to uh, make corrosion resistant uh, layers. Then we can use them as uh, thermal barriers in thin films, or we can also employ them in, employ them in electronics performance enhancement. Now, like I mentioned in the very beginning that if you have a nanomaterial, something which is not visible to your eyes, of course now you need uh, mechanisms so that you can understand about them uh, in the in a better way. So how do we do that? So we have series of sophisticated characterization techniques, which includes uh, a lot of different types like uh, this atomic force microscopy or uh, scanning electron microscopy or uh, uh, your uh, TEM, tunning electron microscopy and like that we have many, many different types of characterization uh, possible. But of course, we don't have time today enough to discuss all of that. So I'll just give you an example of this atomic force microscopy. So what happens here is you'll have you'll have a surface here, sample surface, which you are trying to which you are trying to uh, measure. Measure in the sense you are trying to get a, a sample of how the surface looks like. So you want to get it into your visible range. So what you will have you will have a cantilever, and the tip will be very very thin, something like this. This cantilever will, this tip will vibrate over the surface of the sample. And then this sample will be placed in a, uh, in a piezoelectric material and then it will be vibrated at a continuous frequency. And then because it is vibrated at a continuous frequency, whenever this tip is going to touch, there will be a change in this uh, vibration frequency. And then that uh, change is noted down by a laser, which is actually pointed on top of the cantilever beam. And then there is a photodiode. So whenever there is a change of this <coughs> frequency, the laser beam, the incoming laser beam will have a different outgoing frequency and that will be detected by the photo diode and then it will be converted uh, using, uh, using uh, uh, softwares so that it is visible to your eyes so that you can get the image, the topography of the uh, surface. Now, <laughs> AFM has uh, three types. One is known as the contact mode AFM, which is something like this, where the tip is actually touching the surface of the sample. But in such cases, what happens is because there are the, the forces at the tip, and this tip is actually very, 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 very uh, small and tiny. So there is a possibility that the tip 
itself can snap. So this kind of contact mode AFM is used where the overall uh, forces are actually uh, repulsive in nature. Because if it is attractive in nature, then the tip will, uh, there's a chance that the tip will get stuck into the sample surface and then it will uh, break down. Then uh, there are other two types of AFM as well. The other one is the non-contact mode. And as it is understood by the name here, the, the tip will not touch the sample directly, but then there will be, uh, they, they will be the cantilever will be vibrated at a, at a particular frequency. And as the cantilever will come closer to the surface of the sample, this, uh, because of the van der Waal forces, this uh, frequency will uh, change. So when that will change, uh, that will be detected by the photodiode from the laser. Now, and the third is known as tapping mode, where again, yeah, as the name suggests, it will tap. So it, there, it consists of intermittent tapping. So it will neither, it is contact mode. It is, it is not going to contact each and every point, nor it is non-contact, but it is somewhere in between where the tip will tap. So by employing such kind of techniques or maybe SEM, SEM is very frequently used we can figure out the size of the uh, type of the uh, nanomaterials. So for example, if you synthesize CNTs or any other nanomaterial of your own and you try to find out whether they are, uh, what is the quality of that nanomaterials, whether they are good, whether they are bad, what will be their performances, you will have to essentially do such kind of characterization. Now, after that, the synthesis. So synthesis of nanomaterials or nano devices for that matter, or sensors of nano regimes can be done in two types. One is the top down approach, which means you start from a bigger block and you cut it down to bring it down to the nano scale. Or you start with bottom up approach where you start with molecules or something like a polymer. So you start with a monomer and then it, it forms a polymer. Um, uh, of its own, like self-assembly. Now in top-down approach, one of the most uh, commonly used is photolithography. In photolithography, what is done is we have, uh, suppose, suppose this is a surface, and this is a surface where we want to create a pattern. So first of all, what we'll do, we'll clean it up. We'll clean it up. That could be cleaned by uh, chemical or it can be cleaned using plasma as well. And then we apply a photoresist. This photoresist is actually, it can, it is, um, it is influenced by the light. It is influenced by photons, so it is known as photoresist. And application of that photoresist can be done by various techniques, including spin coating. Spin coating is a very easy technique where you have to uh, have the appropriate uh, solution. And then there is a spin coater which rotates at a particular frequency. You keep your sample and you drop one. Uh, one drop of the solution of the photoresist, and then because of the high centrifugal force uh, created by the constant RPM of the uh, substrate, this uh, droplet it expands and forms a kind of film, and uh, and it, it it becomes a film on top of the, your substrate. So that's how you can apply uh, this kind of photoresist uh, material, and then uh, you can use pre-baking, or you may not use if there is a lot of moisture, you can use that. Then what you do is you, you put a mask. A mask means there is a pattern which is created so that only a certain uh, part of that will allow the lights to come in while the other parts will block the light. Now, when, you, when that happens, as you can see here, this is where the lights are allowed to come inside and this is where uh, they are blocked. Now, depending on what kind of photoresist material if you have, uh, you have the, the, the different parts of the material will become soluble in a developer solution. So if you have a positive photoresist, if you have a positive photoresist, then what happens is your parts which are exposed to the light, they become soluble in the developer solution. But if you have a negative photoresist, then whichever parts are not exposed to the light, they become uh, soluble in a developer solution. So once you put that in a developer solution, all of this will go away and only this part will remain. So now when this part will remain, if you can, you can etch the, the remaining portion. So you can etch here, you can etch here, something like this. And once your desired etching has been done, then you can simply strip off the photoresist so that your substrate has now been etched in a particular way. So you can do this if you want to create thin films of uh, this S type uh, structures, like I mentioned. So if you want to create a structure, uh, meander structure of the film, then you can go for photolithography. However, this is a very time consuming and costly 
method. So we always look for something. I'll tell you what kind of things which can replace maybe photolithography so that we can have uh, better sensors, but much more cost effective. Now, uh, the bottom up approach, one example of the bottom up approach is this chemical vapor deposition. Uh, I'm talking about this because this is what our group has uh, worked on. In chemical vapor deposition, what happens is you'll have a, you'll have a chamber like this, and then there's a furnace over here, uh, which is surrounding the, uh, the, the pipe. This is kind of quartz pipe, uh, glass pipe. And what you do is you put your samples inside here. You put your samples inside here. The samples are usually coated with a, uh, with a, with a catalyst. So let's suppose if you want to synthesize CNTs, carbon nanotubes, what you'll do, you will put a, you will have a substrate, let's suppose silicon substrate, and you put a layer of a catalyst on top of that, then you place it inside here. And then what do you do? You pump, you vacuum pump the system. You bring down the vacuum to very, 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 very low vacuum, maybe 10 to the power minus three millibar if I remember correctly. And then what you do is you have two types of, uh, two types of gases. So one is your neutral gas like argon, or sometimes in nitrogen is also used. So you put argon so that there is a safer environment that is created. So it's a neutral gas, so it is not going to uh, react with any other uh, ions or particles. After that, if of course, if you want to suppose, let's suppose um, we talk about CNT, if you want to synthesize CNT, what you'll do, you will take a carbon source gas, a gas which will have carbon molecules in it. So you take the source gas like methane or ethane, and then you put it, you pump it uh, at a particular at a particular ratio, uh, but you have to be, so there's a lot of optimization and parametric study that goes on whenever you want to synthesis, uh, synthesize nanomaterials, because the, what amount of uh, uh, deposition rate you are uh, doing, what amount of time frame you are considering, what is the ratio of the uh, neutral uh, process gas to the source gas is, all these kinds of, kinds, uh, of things uh, need to be optimized in order to uh, from the nanomaterials. So once you employ the source gas here, the source gas molecules, they will come and then they will react with the catalyst. And then after reacting, then they will start creating, if the, if the environment is optimized, if the ambient is perfect for their growth, then nanomaterials will start growing. So employing this technique, uh, uh, from uh, is uh, usually used for uh, synthesizing carbon nanotubes in house. And uh, there are other bottom up approaches also, which are known as physical vapor deposition. So there are different types of physical vapor deposition, uh, uh, including vacuum evaporation, sputter deposition. I'm not going to go in details into that, but this is the kind of CF, um, the CVD uh, chamber that we use. This is the alumina board where we put our um, silicon uh, templates. Remember, I talked about this uh, substrate that I said that I can bring the whole entire thin film sensors down to the nano region if I can uh, bring down the thickness of the film. So now, if the thickness of the film has come to nanometers, essentially the thickness of my substrate will also come down. So here we can use silicon as our substrate. And uh, then we put that uh, on top of here, uh, we, we coat it with a catalyst. Um, that catalyst could be anything that helps the growth of CNTs. We use nickel and then we uh, put this inside. When we put this inside and then we close them up and then we evacuate the system. And then finally we heat the furnace up to 700 degrees Celsius and we pump the gases. And uh, that's how after, after a lot of optimization and parametric studies, we created carbon nanotubes. Now, when we created carbon nanotubes, so let's talk a little bit about CNTs as well. Why, why CNTs? So CNTs are usually like now they are almost over researched. People are no more interested in CNTs. In the past two decades, people have studied uh, so much right from the starting from its discovery by EGMI in 1991. And people figured out CNTs are like absolutely like fantastic nanomaterials. They have uh, unique combination of stiffness, strength, uh, tenacity, and uh, compared to other fiber materials, even a small amount of CNT can improve the overall property of the of the nano composite uh, by a huge extent. And then, depending on their orientation, their conductivity also changes. So, like if you compare armchair CNTs with zigzag CNTs, uh, basically what I mean is that the way how you are rolling the sheet. 
So it's a hexagonal uh, sheet of uh, carbon atoms, and if you roll them up, if you if you, if it is flat, it is called graphene. If you roll them up, it becomes now, depending on how you are rolling the sheets, will give the ultimate properties of the cement is whether it will be metallic or it will be non-metallic or conducting or semiconducting like that. Now, and then by changing the size, the diameter of the cement is, by changing the di uh, diameter of the cement is, we can overall tune the overall properties. And then carbon nanotubes has been tremendously used as fillers and the, it has shown improved strength of the overall composite. So because of that, they have been used in so many uh, in so many applications. So that was also one of the reasons why we were also we got also interested in carbon nanotubes. And uh, also there are other things like uh, they are very elastic and then they can bend without damage. So they can be used in probes like high resolution scanning probe microscopy. But anyway, this was not for our uh, uh, research. We were just focusing on something. We wanted a nano composite, which will be having very high thermal and electrical conductivity so that our sensors performance will improve so that we can have higher sensitivity and, and measure, or we can, we can detect lower heat fluxes. That was our entire motivation. So. Uh, now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the type of uh, synthesis of CNT. When you try to grow CNTs in-house, then uh, this is still debatable, although people have been done it so many times. There are basically two ways how the CNT growth will happen. So one is known as the tip growth, the other one is known as the root growth. So if you remember, I mentioned here in CBD that you have a source gas carbon source gas which will come inside and then your substrate is already coated with a catalyst. The so, so the source gas atoms will come, the hydrocarbon will come and it will decompose. So let's suppose this is the catalyst uh, particle, the metal particle which is acting as a catalyst and this is our substrate. Now depending on the addition between the metal and the insula uh, insulating substrate, depending on uh, what kind of interaction they have, whether they have a strong interaction or they have a weak interaction, the, the type of, the way in how C, in which CNT grows will vary. So for example, let's talk about root growth. So what happens is once you allow the source gas to come in, this uh, hydrocarbon molecules, they will come and they will start getting decomposed on the top surface of this metal catalyst. The carbon will diffuse down through the metal now, if the interaction between this catalyst particle and the substrate is very, very strong, then the CNT is not able to push this away from the substrate. So when it is not able to push it away from the <coughs> substrate, what happens is the subsequent hydrocarbon is still diffusing. It is still diffusing inside this and the CNTs will start growing in the periphery. So they will start growing somewhere in, in the periphery of the metal particle. And this is, um, I mean, it's difficult to uh, discuss it in, a, uh, in a, just one lecture. This is a, a, something which is very uh, similar to the VLS growth. Anyway, so this uh, hydrocarbon will keep diffusing inside this metal catalyst. And then because it is not able to push this away from the uh, insulate, uh, from the substrate, it will start growing on the periphery. And when, as long as the diffusion takes place, the CNTs will start growing on the periphery and they will start growing on the top. This is known as the base growth model because this metal catalyst particle still remains in the base and the CNTs grows on top of that. On the contrary, if you talk about the tip growth, what happens is now if the interaction between this metal particle and the substrate is very, very weak, then what happens once this diffusion happens, when the hydrocarbon diffuses, it is able to push this away from the substrate. Once this uh, pushes it away from the substrate, then you will see that the CNT is, because they are getting diffused into the bottom, and so they, are, they start growing from here. Now, as long as this surface is open and it is allowing more diffusion of the hydrocarbon, the CNT will, will start growing, and they will keep growing until this entire surface of this metal catalyst is fully covered and there is no more uh, space left for any kind of catalytic activity. So this kind of tip growth and root growth happens. These are the main two way how CNT growth happens. And during our uh, CVD also, we figured out that 
using this SEM. So this kind of images will be in SEM. If we have a very nice high resolution SEM, you can you can actually see where the catalyst particle is, whether it's at the top or whether it is at the bottom. Now, uh, uh, CNDs instead of uh, instead of synthesizing them in house, you can simply uh, buy them. They are also commercially available. However, in that case, you will have no uh, you don't you will not have any um, control over their properties. And but even then, people have used such uh, strain sensors made from CNDs uh, simply by spray coating. So that means they just make this composite uh, and then they spray it on onto uh, directly onto the onto the substrate. Now, when they are sprayed onto the substrate, they are in a random orientation of something like this. This. After that, what they do is they, they stretch it and then they relax it. So in case of strain sensors, uh, this is how it happens. When they are stretched, this um, orientation of the CNTs changes. So they get they get oriented in one particular direction. And then when you when they are released, that uh, they do not actually come back to their original random position. So this is known as actually the hysteresis. So this is, although CND based pressure and uh, strain sensors have been uh, developed, but these are the types of problems that is usually uh, faced by researchers. The first is the C, it's very hard to disperse CNTs uniformly in a composite. And secondly, if you are using in this kind of uh, strain sensors, if you use this relaxation and uh, stretching, then they do not come back to their original position and some certain amount of uh, electrical resistance will remain. That means if you start from zero, they will not come back to zero after your first trial. So some amount of hysteresis will always uh, build up. Now, this is with respect to our uh, biomedical field. This kind of strain sensors are being used in e-skins and in different uh, other uh, medical uh, industry. But these strain sensors can also be employed in something else, which is related to the aerospace. And that is known as structural health monitoring. Structural health monitoring. So, but before going to that, let me talk about the temperature sensing. Part. Now we figured out that if we use CNTs and um, if we can make this laminated layers of thin films, if we can maintain the uniformity of the thin films, then maybe we'll have something which is uh, performing much more better than the original metallic thin film sensors. So keeping that in view, this is what we uh, tried to create. But while creating this was not easy, we had to use different types of substrates starting from uh, the normal polished, unpolished silicon, and then DLC coated nickel, uh, silicon, and all of this. And then we went on a huge amount of parametric analysis and optimization. And uh, we, we actually successfully created a film of uh, a CNT film. But then when we tried to create more than one layer, so it goes something like this, you have a catalyst layer, then you fabricate the CNT layer, then you on top of that, you again top another catalyst layer, and on top of that, you try to create another CNT layer, something like this. So this is what we, this came after a lot of heat and trial method that we have the substrate, we coated it with a nickel layer, then we, we uh, formed a layer of CNT film, then we did another nickel layer, then we did another CNT film. So this is known as bilayer uh, nanocomposite thin film sensor. So while doing that, uh, we we noticed that it is coming off. It is not even not even ab able to uh, 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 scotch tape uh, test. So in order to do that, we figured out that we need to increase the addition between the CNTs and the substrate. So in order to do that, we what we opted finally after a lot of trial, we figured out that maybe we can use porous substrate. So then we took our silicon. We made porous substrate. A porous substrate looks something like this. It, although this is FIV etched, but the porous substrate we did uh, using first we 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 sputtered a, a thin uh, silver layer and then we annealed it at 300 degrees Celsius so that they are um, so that they are broken into uh, smaller pieces and then AG nanoparticles are created. Then we etched it in a solution of hydrofluoric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And finally, after removing all of them, we had our porous substrate. Even while making this porous substrate, we had to do this optimization so that the depth of the 
uh, the depth of the pores are not very high enough. And only after that, we finally were able to create this bilayer structure. Otherwise, this second layer, as soon as you try to put the second nickel layer, uh, it, 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 will, it was coming off. Now, we, we adopted a Although CFD is, of course, it's not very cost effective. It's not very simple either. But this deposition of the catalyst nickel layer was actually very easy. We used simple electro deposition and we figured out this bilayer thin film sensor. This bilayer can actually be now increased up to multi layer thin film sensors. But there has to be an optimum limit as to how many layers of the thin films you can use because. This film has to again fall into the category of semi infinite solid. So, if you keep on adding multiple layers, then the film thickness will increase and then it will not uh, fall in the category of uh, semi infinite solids. If it doesn't fall in the category of semi infinite solids, you won't be able to capture the heat flux from the temperature sensor. Of course, it will work as a temperature, fantastic temperature sensor, but we will not, won't be able to apply, uh, employ this. Uh, uh, inverse one day heat conduction in order to figure out the heat conduction. Now, like I mentioned that when we deal with nanocomposites or nanomaterials, we essentially have to do the characterization study. So we did a lot of characterization studies starting from SEM, then Raman uh, spectroscopy, then XPS. All of this we did in order to figure out, figure out which is the best possible atmosphere for growth of CNTs. So we changed our deposition uh, temperature at 700, 750, 800, 850, carried out all the SEMs and Ramans. And then we, again, we changed our deposition time. We changed the combination of the source and uh, um, uh, process gas. And after doing all of this, we had finally figured out that we had created a very nice double layered uh, CNT nickel uh, based thin film sensor. And then when we compared it with the original silver or, or sorry, original nickel based uh, thin film sensor, then we saw that ultimately this bilayer was absolutely like much, much, much better than the monolayer one. So there is a hope that if we keep on increasing, maybe up to at least up to tri-layer or maybe, maybe one step even more than that, we can have thin film sensors, which will be much more effective and much more sensitive towards lower heat fluxes. And then they can be essentially used in all of these aerospace applications. Now, the second, uh, now the second type is that we wanted to uh, now a little bit move towards this uh, flexible sensing. Now, okay, the thin film sensors that we have created and we have dealt with until now, all of them were rigid. Of course, they, were, they are fantastic but we lack flexibility. If we can add flexibility, then we have the, um, we have the possibility of uh, using them in uh, even more, you know, wider range of applications. So keep, keeping that in view, we, we wanted to, we uh, actually shifted from this normal nanocomposites, metallic or this kind of nanocomposites to polymer nanocomposites. Now, when you have polymer nanocomposites, then you can have, um, different types of sensors. Now the focus is for multifunctional sensors. So something like a sensor which will be able to measure the temperature, but at the same time will also be able to measure the pressure. Now, if you have to measure the pressure or strain, whatever, so it's the same thing. So suppose if you're applying pressure, your film bends and then you uh, figure out what is the amount of pressure that is being applied. And that, um, can be done if your if your sensor is flexible enough. So only flexible is not sufficient because people have tried with polymer and composite based sensors, but all of them lacked um, either of the two. Either the range was small or the sensitivity was less, or they were not flexible enough. They were not bendable enough. So another important interesting thing that has come up is the hierarchical microstructure. Now, if I have to give you an example of hierarchical microstructure, I can take you to the example of Eiffel Tower. And uh, if you see the Eiffel Tower, it's, a, it's a basically a structure. If you look deeper into the structure, I mean, if you zoom out, you will see that there are also structures within the structure. And then if you zoom that out, you will see that these are uh, made from uh, this kind of structure, which are known as girders. And then each girder has its own shape. So essentially these are structure within a structure. So that means a structural hierarchy has been maintained. 
And because of the structural hierarchy, the ultimate bulk material properties can be tuned as per our requirements. So when once this is recognized, in fact, this structural hierarchy, you can also see in biology, in, in natural um, examples in nature. For example, if you talk about bone, the bones that we have, the bones, it, it has spaces to, uh, it, it accommodates living cells, it accommodates uh, tissues and all. So if you keep on looking down uh, and cutting it down, you will see that it has different structure at different uh, dimension. So from macro to nano, you'll see there are so many structure within a structure. So this kind of structural hierarchy actually gives us the opportunity to figure out novel materials. So if you can have materials having a different hierarchical structure, the ultimate properties will be changed. Employing that in pressure sensors can give us sensors which are very, very highly sensitive in nature and also have wider range of. So people have, uh, um, and this is a recent study uh, and uh, uh, people have tried using this and uh, so they what they do is they create a mold for example like, like a silicon mold and then they deposit the polymer here something like this and then a micro pyramid array is now created so now once this uh, pyramid is created now they will uh, deposit a uh, film of very thin film of some piezo resistive material. Once you have this piezo resistive material, then you have an a flexible electrode some which looks something like this. Now, once you, you press it, if you apply pressure on the top, if you apply force, then this contact area between this electrode and this surface will increase. And depending on how much pressure you are, uh, you are applying or how much bending you are giving to the sensor, the ultimate resistance will change. So this is similar to this RTD. The only problem, only difference is that it does not measure temperature, it measures pressure and it measures in a way. Uh, so this, so that the sensitivity is enhanced to a very great extent. And for creating these uh, structures, the smaller structures, you need not even go for such a uh, high, uh, like creating a mold and all this uh, complicated procedure. You can simply take an aluminum foil. People have done that. You can simply take an aluminum foil. You can take a silk cloth. You can take a, a lotus leaf and then you can put out the pattern and of the polymer because once you put the polymer, it will uh, definitely this, this, uh, this natural things will also act as a mold. And then depending on, uh, because this, uh, we just need to create smaller air cavities. So once we have these smaller air cavities, now depending on how high the or how tall this structure is, we can now keep on increasing our pressure. So our sensitivity enhances our and our sensing range is also improved. So employing these things can be very useful to fabricate uh, pressure sensors or strain sensors, which can be used in aerospace industry. But the problem is once you uh, try to increase the size of the sensor, then of course, remember, just like I said here, in case of CNTs, that there is some amount of hysteresis still left inside it. Once you re release it, uh, that problem again comes up here. And in addition to the problem of uniform dispersion of CNTs. So our idea, the, the work that we are, uh, right now we are carrying on, we are focusing on is this uh, development this large area pressure sensors for structural health monitoring and structural health monitoring is what it means you monitor the health of huge structures like aircraft spacecraft bridges buildings roads etc so that in case of any crack or damage you can you can inform the authority like well ahead of time and then you can you can fix it up so that it does not get collapsed because if you do not have in, uh, a system to monitor the health of your building or maybe your bridge, then it can collapse anytime and that could be catastrophic. So that's why structural health monitoring is very important. And when we do that, we essentially have to now have strain sensors and these strain sensors are what? They're usually uh, tightly put in, in touch with the structure surface or maybe they are embedded inside the structure. But the conventional strain gauges, which has been used until now, they have very a low gauge factor. Gauge factor means the sensitivity is very low. And plus their deformation ability is also very less, just maybe around 2% or 3% at maximum. 
Now, in, remember initially I talked about morphing aircrafts and space, inflated spacecraft, which are used for surveillance and other stuff. So in those kind of systems where this um, structural deformation is greater than even 10%, and those structures are so huge, so they are prone to cracks and damage at any time, at any point. So we need bigger sensors. So if we need large area sensors, and if we want to use nanocomposite, if we want to have the advantages of both nanocomposite and the hierarchical microstructure to build a strain gauge, which is large enough and which is flexible enough so that it can be put all over inside, uh, outside the aircraft, then we'll be able to monitor it very nicely. But the only problem is that we'll have to sort out the issues of this hysteresis and all those problems. So these are the kind of challenges which we are uh, trying to uh, really focus on now, that we are trying to reduce the hysteresis loss. And uh, of course, as the sensor becomes big, the response will also become slower. So we are trying to do something so that the res response does not get uh, delayed so that we have still more or less the same response time and uh, while we take care of the hysteresis. And then we are trying to do something so that we do not have to compromise on the sensing ability of the sensor. So this is what exactly we are working on right now. And for that, the material, this piezoelectric material, which we are trying to use uh, is uh, nanocomposite. And nanocomposite means we are talking about polymer nanocomposites here. So polymer nanocomposite means if one of the two uh, composite means essentially you are mixing two things. So if one of them is in a nano dimension, it becomes a nanocomposite. And if one of them is a polymer, it becomes a polymer nanocomposite. So polymer nanocomposite means the matrix is polymer and you're adding small nanomaterials that could be some metallic nanomaterials inside the polymer so that you can have different uh, overall properties. So that those kind of nanocomposites are uh, right now like 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 the hot cake and people are researching a lot. They have been employed in so many things, not only in sensors but also in developing lightweight and strong uh, aircraft parts. In fact, they have been uh, they have been used by uh, this passenger aircraft Boeing seven four seven and seven six seven and the. Uh, there are lots of parts, including rudders and elevators and flaps, in order to reduce the weight and to enhance the fuel efficiency. So they have used nanocomposites from uh, based on carbon fibers and uh, other fillers. So the most common are you can take any kind of polymers like PAN and, and, or epoxy or anything, and then can you you can take uh, fillers like uh, carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofibers, graphene, graphene oxide, all those kind of things. And you can try to figure out a novel nanocomposite material and you can combine it with novel hierarchical microstructure so that you can have a large area pressure sensor, which will be overcoming all the uh, challenges that the conventional sensors have now. And this dispersion of nano, uh, the, this nanocomposites, when you form the nanocomposites, you have several ways to disperse the nano uh, particles inside the polymer that can be done using in situ polymerization. That means um, you have the nanotubes or the nanomaterials already there in the solution and you add the monomer and then that monomer forms polymer itself in the presence of the nanotubes. So that actually gives a much better dispersion of the nanotubes or you can go for other methods like simple ultrasonic blending or melt mixing, but those methods are not very good. We are trying to come up with something known as uh, electro spinning for developing these nanocomposites. And right now I cannot comment how successful electro spinning will turn up. But of course, if we can get a nice uh, uni equal, uniformly dispersed uh, CNT polymer nanocomposite film, and if you can employ that in this large area pressure sensor, then nothing like that. So, and finally, Yeah, so like I mentioned, these are the types of challenges when we talk about CND based uh, polymers uh, in specific to aerospace applications that uh, we need a production method for large scale production, because if we go for CVD or this kind of things for producing nanomaterials, then the production is really low. And secondly, this dispersion of CNT is very, very difficult um, when it comes to this uh, CNT based nanocomposites. So this is one of the issues that people are really, uh, trying to focus on. Then there are other issues like the addition issues that I mentioned in the very beginning 
that when we use normal silicon substrate, the CNT film was just coming off and we had to go for porous substrate. So those kind of addition and alignment issues, alignment because the CNTs, if the alignment changes, then their properties also change. So for example, again, if I talk about the quantum confinement, carbon nanotubes is like, it's a, it's a nanotube. So the electron is free to move in one direction and it is confined in the other two. So it is highly conductive in the longitudinal direction and highly insulating in the lateral one. So if the alignment of the CNT changes, then the overall property of your composite will also change. So we try to keep them aligned at uh, in, in one direction, their orientation uh, should be in the same direction, but achieving that is very, very tough. So that is another challenge. And finally, because if, you, if, if we are employing them in aerospace or any other, even in medical field, toxicity is another uh, main thing that needs to be taken care of. Now, uh, as for conclusion, I can say that every sensor has its own merits and demerits, and uh, there is no sensor which can claim that it has the highest sensitivity, the highest wide uh, sensing range, and the best deformability, and the lowest hysteresis, and the lowest response time. Clubbing all of these things together, it's not possible, at least until now, because at some point of time, you have to consider a trade-off between uh, all of them. It's only a point of optimization, and depending on what kind of application you are uh, tuning the properties, that we have to do that. Secondly, like I mentioned, this photolithography and all these conventional patterning techniques, the, those are very expensive and slow. So we need to come up with some cost-effective techniques, like, I don't know, some something very simple, like maybe a laser marker or something, so that we can create patterns very efficiently and in a large uh, scale. Then... On, on top of that, finally, we need to understand exactly how this, these properties of nano regime uh, are actually influencing uh, are, or maybe being influenced by the interaction between the nanomaterial and the matrix material and maybe their size, uh, shape, density, structure, etc. So that, that maybe at some point we can, we are able to uh, we are able to transfer those properties of uh, nano regime into the macro scale. If you can do that, nothing like that. But otherwise, in, in case of sensors, there are other problems to challenges to, to tackle. For example, in case of uh, you know, piezoelectric type sensors, uh, a lot of energy is wasted because the, because the electrodes are always in a contacting mode. So even in the initial state, even if there is no uh, pressure employed, the electrodes are already in the conducting mode. So if we can do something so that the electrodes remain non-conducting in the initial uh, time, then we can save a lot of energy. And, and then there are other problems like increasing resolutions, uh, so the capacitive sensors um, are having low resolution. So if we cannot employ them in high resolution techniques, although their sensitivity is, um, uh, uh, although their range is very nice. So in order to do that, again, we have to figure out, uh, we have to trade off between two, three different properties and we have to figure out what kind of application we are intending to. As far as aerospace application is uh, uh, considered, I think uh, the upcoming uh, uh, upcoming missiles and aerial vehicles and aircraft, next generation aircraft, they focus a lot on being lightweight and increasing speed and increasing maneuverability and their uh, visual and thermal signature. This visual and thermal signature is especially for military purposes so that the enemies are not able to detect the presence of your missile or your aircraft in their territory or something. So this kind of work are like upcoming. So if you want, you can take up one of those and you can work on that. But otherwise, if you want specific research possibilities in polymer nanocomposites, specifically for aerospace application, maybe you can take uh, all of this. So you can, you can figure out something so that um, we can produce the uh, nanotubes or the nanocomposites at the very the high manufacturing rate. We can uh, try to understand the load transfer mechanism uh, so that we can uh, we can carry forward this from the nano region to the macro scale, or we can try to figure out uh, manu manufacturing methods which are cost effective and uh, to study and understand what kind of interaction goes on between the nanomaterials and the 
matrix material, and finally, uh, how what can we do to achieve uniform dispersion and all? So although these uh, nanocomposites are having absolutely fantastic properties, and they have been employed in lot many applications, including sensors, but still there is a lot which uh, needs to be focused on. And um, I find it quite interesting. Uh, you can pick up any of these problems and start working right now. As for me, I'd like to uh, stay with my sensors for quite some time, probably before moving on to something else. So this much is it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, lending me your ear. If you have any question, I'd be happy to answer that. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I request the participants, if you have any queries, you can drop it in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I don't see any question yet. But yes, if you can write to me anytime, if you uh, want to reach out to me, I have my website also. You can simply type Shruti Dhara Sharma in Google and my website will come up. Or you can simply drop an email to me and I'll respond back to you with my ideas. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Uh... All the participants, uh, we have shared the feedback form in the chat box. Kindly go through the link and uh, do the needful. Ma'am, I think there are no queries. If there are any queries, we'll ask them to drop it a mail to you. Okay. Thank you then. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. All the participants, uh, feedback link is given in the chat box. Uh, just do the needful.